Hello, welcome back to another class of Reaching New Levels of Faith. This is class number six on how do I acquire searching faith. So far we've talked about what faith is and why I should want to work on my faith. And I've taught you the five basic levels of faith, which we're going to be talking about throughout the class. I've also shared with you about how do I graduate from imitating faith? I'll remind you, imitating faith is basically the faith of a child. I don't understand, I just do what you do. And so we've talked about how to, to mature a child in their faith. And then in the last class, I talked to you about how to recognize affiliating faith. First of all, how to recognize it in yourself. If you believe what you believe because others believe it, then you have affiliating faith but also how to recognize in other people through their prayers, through their comments, through the way they react to change. I've showed you how to recognize a feeling of faith. So now we're to the point where let's say that I believe that I have a feeling faith, but I want to mature my faith. I want to go on to have searching faith. How do I acquire searching faith? Here's the five basic levels of faith, imitating faith, affiliating faith, searching faith, solidifying faith, and mature faith. And so I really need you to memorize those. Hopefully you've done that. Another thing I hope that you've done by now is I hope you have a Bible open in front of you. I understand some of you can't do that as you're listening to this in different venues, but if you can sit down with a Bible in front of you, and then that workbook, hopefully you've ordered that through BibleTalk.tv and you have the workbook in front of you and you can fill in the notes and it'll have the scriptures. Go ahead and open your Bible to John chapter 8. That's where we're going to be at in just a little bit. I'm trying to convince you that even though we come to Christ with a feeling of faith, you really don't want to stay at a feeling of faith. You want to go on to search out your faith. I want to share with you a scripture in John chapter 8 that I think helps to illustrate this. In John chapter 8, starting in verse 31, it says, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him. Now notice who he's talking to. He's talking to Jews, but Jews who believed him. <clears throat> if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, have never yet been slaves to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be Free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, and yet you seek to kill me, because my work has no place in you. Excuse me, my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. Jesus is explaining here that even though you believe, if you continue in my words, then you're truly disciples of mine. See, they, just the fact that they believed didn't mean they were really disciples. A disciple is someone who continues in the word. Notice that. Not just initially sees the word or hears the word. You know, when we hear the, the truth about salvation through Christ and we respond to that by obeying the gospel, that truth sets us free initially from our sins. But there's a side of truth that is ongoing, is it not? I mean, I've, I'm learning things, and I hope you are too, that are truths from God's Word that I didn't know a year ago or five years ago. Truth is something that we are continually doing. And that's why he says, if you continue in my words, then you're truly disciples of mine, and the truth will set you free. And so that's God's desire for you, is that you will be set free. And if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So let me share with you five things that you can do that will help you to acquire searching faith. First thing I want you to do is ask yourself three questions. The first question is this. If blank stopped coming, would I keep going? Now I want you to take a moment, and in that blank, I want you to write the name 
of the individual who has the biggest impact on you spiritually. This is a person that if you heard that they stopped going to church, or if you heard that they fell away, you'd be like, what? I can't believe it. That person fell away? So think of a person, maybe it's an elder, a preacher, maybe a parent, maybe it's a, a spouse. Somebody that have, would have the biggest impact that if they stopped coming to church, you would have a hard time to keep going. And write that person's name in there and then ask yourself, if so-and-so stopped coming, would I keep going? Second thing I want you to ask yourself, I know what I believe, but do I know why I believe it? Now, this was the test of affiliating faith, is if you believe the things that you believe because others believe them, then you have affiliating faith. So now it's time to flip that around into a question, say, now, where am I really at? Am I believing the things that I believe because others believe it? And if so, I need to move beyond that. I need to get to that point that I've searched it out and I own these things for myself. And then the third question I want you to ask yourself, and this is a hard one, Am I willing to change what I believe if the Bible says so? Let's say you're a person who has been in the church for a long time, but you have always had affiliating faith. You just believe the things that you believe because other people believe them. You've never really searched it out. Well, now you decide you're going to challenge yourself to search. But what are you going to do if you find out that something that you believed for a long, long time is really not in the Bible. In fact, it contradicts what the Bible says. Are you willing to change what you believe if the Bible says so? Think about that question. So those are three things you need to ask yourself before we begin. Second thing that you can do that will help more than anything probably in searching out your faith is to share your faith. I want to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 1. After Jesus is resurrected and he is about to ascend into heaven, he gets the disciples together right before he is, departs from this earth. In Acts, chapter 1, he has this final conversation with them. He says, well, it says, starting in verse 6, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Here's his reply, verse 7. It's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. It has always been Jesus' intention for his disciples to be his witnesses, to go out and to testify what they know about the Christ and share that with others. The reason we study classes like this and come to church and hear sermons and go to Bible classes is so that we can have this constant feeding of God's Word. But the reason we're doing that is so it goes out. You know, water flowing into a pond but not flowing out becomes stagnant. We understand that. Okay? Same thing happens with our faith. In fact, there's a situation in Acts chapter 8 where the disciples were pretty much bunched up in Jerusalem. They, they'd stayed there. That's where it all began. And because of the persecution, which was caused by Saul of Tarsus, who would later become the Apostle Paul, and he was there when Stephen was stoned to death. Acts chapter 8, we'll pick up in verse 1. It says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, meaning Stephen being put to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles stayed there in Jerusalem. Now some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, verse 4 says, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. 
this persecution turned out to be one of the, the greatest things that happened to the church because it made those who were just kind of huddled there in Jerusalem, just dependent upon the apostles, it scattered them throughout Judea, throughout Samaria, and they went to different places and they began sharing their faith. What do you think happened when they started sharing their faith? Well, their faith began to grow and they began to learn more. You know, next point here, when others are questioning you, it makes you search out the things that you believe. If you know you're going to get questioned, you have to think, okay, if they ask me this, how am I going to respond to that? There's a situation in Acts chapter 4 where the apostles were questioned and they knew just how to answer that. Acts chapter 4 beginning in verse 15. But when they ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Oh, I love that answer, don't you? It's like Peter and John had anticipated that question. They were arrested and they knew that you know, they're, they're likely going to ask us not to preach at all anymore in the name of Jesus. And they could have said, oh, okay, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be better. And that would have got them out of jail. But instead they said, you judge for yourself. Should we obey men or should we obey God? We cannot help speaking about God. Just the fact that they were out sharing their faith caused them to be questioned about the things they were doing and their questions caused them to search out the right answer. Share your faith with other people and that causes you to grow in your personal faith. You think about it, a sign of maturity is learning how to feed others. When we're babies, somebody has to feed us. We get old enough, we learn how to feed ourselves, but an adult, a, a parent, feeds their children. And so a sign of maturity is learning how to feed others. So the second thing you can do is learn how to share your faith. Ask yourself the questions, learn how to share your faith. Let me give you a third thing. Practice talking with others about spiritual things. You know, we're in casual conversation every day, most of us with somebody. Learn how to evolve conversations into a Christ-centered topic. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul speaking to the church there in Colossae, look what he says starting in verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which... I also have been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Now conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Paul says, pray for me, that a door will be open. He was imprisoned and, and there were not many doors open. But he says, I'm, I'm just praying that somebody will be around, a guard, another prisoner, somebody that I can share with and just pray for me. But he says, also for yourself. You need to learn how to let your speech, as he says, always be with grace, seasoned with salt, making the most of these opportunities. In your day-to-day -day conversations, learn how to evolve the conversation in a casual way to where it's a Christ-centered topic. You know, I don't mean that 
Somebody says, hey, did you see that ball game last night? Says, yes, and that reminds me, you need to be saved. You know, that's not, it doesn't have to be awkward. Learn how to hear things, to listen to people, and then to work with the conversation, a sense that somebody needs to talk about some spiritual things and be ready to talk to them about that. And another piece of advice under this, I've learned how to practice talking about spiritual things, is do it at church. I have here a note in your workbook, talk with brothers about Christ, and you can talk with others about Christ. If we can't talk about Christ at church, I mean, where can we talk about Him? And so get in the habit when you're in the fellowship, and I know it's not, uh, it's not sinful to talk about other things, uh, talk about where you're going to go to eat, or talk about the ball game, or the weather, you know, that's fine. But learn how to get on that spiritual level and say, hey, how are you doing spiritually? What are you studying right now in your quiet time? We've got to be able to learn how to do that with others. And if we can't talk with each other about Jesus, we're going to have a very hard time talking to other people about Christ. All right, there's three things so far you can do to help work on your faith. Here's a fourth thing you can do. Read some good books. Listen to some good messages. And by the way, this is what uh, BibleTalk.tv is all about. There are books available. There's some good uh, articles and obviously some good messages, classes and sermons that you can take. And, and it's a great work. I, I'm uh, grateful to be part of a congregation. We help to sponsor BibleTalk.tv. I know our elders are, are excited about the work that it does. And so uh, it's a great work uh, to get behind, but it's also a great listening and learning tool. And so I, I hope that you will take advantage of that. But it's good to read some uh, books and to listen to some things on biblical topics. As you're searching, you're going to find out areas that you're weak in in your faith and you're going to need strengthening. So seek out what others are thinking about a biblical topic and discover what is consistent with the Bible. In Acts chapter 17, let's go back to the book of Acts here for a moment. I use this example when we're talking about the, the five levels of faith. As a biblical example, I use the Bereans. And we looked at this verse before, Acts chapter 17. We'll just look at verse 11. It says, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great, great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And so there's an encouragement to every day be searching, be examining. But soon after this, Paul went on to Athens and he was teaching there at the Areopagus. And notice what it says still in chapter 17 and verse 19. It says, And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. They said, Paul, you got some strange teachings, but we want to hear this. We want to find out if it's so or not. That's what the uh, Athenians, that's what they prided themselves in, was their philosophies and their search for knowledge and their love for wisdom. And says that when Paul came along, they said, we want to hear some more about this. Well, you need to study and search, and it helps just to get a hold of some books. And, and I, I intentionally, when I'm studying a subject, I try to hear kind of the other side of an of a issue and see what others are thinking about that or try to be a little open-minded, although I have here a, a caution on your screen that says don't be too open-minded or your brains will fall out. It's kind of a humorous way of reminding us that you can be a little too open-minded and you know you start searching some things that, that cause you to actually struggle in your faith instead of help your faith. But it's, there's, it's advantageous if you can learn how to spit out the bones, so to speak, to hear somebody who may not be quite believing the same thing that you are, to hear what they're saying, just so you can see, well, okay, they're right up to this point, and then that goes against this scripture. That's what searching is all about. So reading some books, listening to some messages, that's another way to help you to grow in your faith. The fifth and final thing, if you're going to search out your faith, and this is a given, number five, you need to focus on getting to know Jesus. We're not just searching for anything. 
We're searching specifically to get to know Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 12, and this is a scripture that's been on my mind. I've, I've preached on this lately. Hebrews chapter 12, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We're trying to build up our faith here. And the way we do that is we turn to the author and the perfecter of faith. You want to learn about faith? Nobody did it better than Jesus did. He was the epitome of faithfulness. And so we, if in this search, as we're trying to search out our faith, we want to focus on, fix our eyes on, getting to know Jesus. Jesus was so focused. He endured the cross. He scorned its shame. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. He was rewarded. You also will be rewarded in your search if your focus is to get to know Jesus. Next and last point here, the more you understand Jesus, the deeper your faith is going to become. Nobody ever walked away from Jesus indifferent. Read the Gospels. And when somebody encountered Jesus, they either loved him or they hated him and wanted to kill him. Nobody was ever neutral. And so one of those two things is going to happen to you too. The more you study Jesus, you're either going to quit, you're going to say, I'm not going to do this, or you're going to fall head over heels in love with Jesus, and your faith is going to grow and it's going to flourish. Really want you to have that searching faith. But with the searching faith comes some struggles. And so in our next class, class number seven, we're going to talk about the struggles of searching faith. I really commend you for hanging in there this long and, and learning. I hope that you're enjoying this class. I have much more to teach you. There's some more of this foundational stuff, and then we'll get to what I think is the fun stuff. That's when we're going to start looking at some Bible characters and really start getting into the, the nuts and bolts, the practicality of how to use the five levels of faith, and as we're about to learn this next class, the four struggles of searching faith. So come back and join us, and we'll see you next time.